Yeah, so hey everyone, welcome to our second session. We're super excited to have you all here today. And today's session's theme is why water? So if we go to the next slide with our agenda on it, um, we're basically gonna be going over just a little bit of the structure of our program. And then we're gonna go into some water facts and then we're really excited to introduce our guest speaker. Um, so if you go to the next slide, our program has three modules. So it's education, allocentrism, and action. And in education, you'll learn about different elements of water. In allocentrism, you'll learn about skills such as design thinking. And then in action, you'll be invited to a career fair and work on projects for World Water Day. Each module is about two weeks. And we did send out an email after our last session with the overall program outline. So if you want a more detailed view of what that looks like, you can definitely check that out. And then speaking of World Water Day on the next slide. Um, so World Water Day, it's on March 22nd and the theme is oceans. So while going through, through the program, we want you to kind of brainstorm different projects you could do related to this and see um, how you could apply what you're learning in each ses session to World Water Day. And then later you'll have chances to work in groups and actually follow through with one of your project ideas. And if you do want some ideas um, on projects, we do have our World Toilet Day projects from our last cohort. Um, you can check them out in the link I just put in the chat. They did a lot of social media projects like Instagram posts and music videos, and they were really great. So you can look at those, but you don't have to do a project related to social media. You can come up with anything else. So yeah, and then if we go to the next slide. Um, yes, announcements. We do have a um, internship opportunity for you guys at Evoqua. And it's a really great opportunity. Here's the link in the chat if you wanna read more about it and maybe apply. If you guys have any questions about that, you can feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to answer them. But just something for you guys to take into consideration. And then the next slide. Okay, yeah, so now we're gonna go into some water facts. Um, if you guys have heard of this fact, you guys can you know, put a thumbs up, maybe use like the little reactions. Um, and so, yeah, let's just see like what you guys know. Maybe you guys jot these down if you think they're interesting. We can go to the first slide of facts. Okay, so the first fact, 1% um, uh, of the investment of global GDP is needed to solve global water challenges. Has anyone ever heard of this fact? Does anyone have any comments or thoughts or reactions? Oh, I see a thumbs up from Riley. Okay, okay. Not a well-known fact. That's okay though, now we know it. Um, 29 cents is the cost of providing water security each day to the global population. I don't see many thumbs up, but that's okay. Um, $1 spent on food prevention, or $1 spent on food prevention saves $62 in flood restoration costs. 18,000 jobs are created for every $1 billion invested in the water sector. Oh, I see a thumbs up, nice. Does anyone have any like reactions to these um, facts or any thoughts? What do you mean by 29 cents of the cost of, like is that per individual person? Yeah, Stuart, do you want to elaborate more? Yeah, and Bob, um, I, I, I'm grimacing as you're probably looking at these stats, probably because you may know these numbers to be different, but the, all these numbers are not our numbers. These numbers are coming from, whether it's United Nations or World Economic Forum or some other credible site. Um, that specific fact of 29 cents um, is per person. Yes, yeah, so. Correct. Um, you know, when you look at that, that seems incredibly reasonable and very affordable and something that we should be able to accomplish. Correct. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I mean, it, well, I don't want to steal the show until you're done with that, but I have an opinion on the consulting engineering industrial complex that basically takes, you know, 50 cents of every dollar and, and basically spends it on really nice dinners for their clients. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness. Well, as you can get a little intro uh, emissaries that Bob uh, pulls every every punch and um, he does not hold back from speaking the truth. So um, is it time for me to introduce Bob? Caroline? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I am deeply grateful to introduce my friend and advisor, Bob Bocock. Bob and I met through Aaron Brockovich. Some of you may know Aaron's fame for her work that she did, where, which Bob was intimately and still is intimately involved with, that um, dealt with chemical pollution in a small community in Southern California, where PG&E was the uh, polluter. And I think it was close to 13 years they worked on that together to come to a settlement, which was a significant settlement. And while it was a win, it was really an acknowledgement for the small guy um, has a voice and the small guy um, has an ability to be cared for and protected. And that's one thing Bob will talk today about is about his work for low income and, and minority communities. And Bob is one of the most esteemed, experienced and knowledgeable people in the water industry from every dimension. And I have incredible favor and respect for him. And you're gonna learn why. So I'm just gonna turn over to Bob to let him start. And uh, you'll get a chance to engage with Bob. And while he's giving a presentation, if you have questions or comments, one, please put them in the chat. Two, if you wanna uh, engage and ask Bob during the presentation, I think that would be fine as well. So don't be bashful to, and you, know, you don't have to wait till the end for us to do a Q and A. Is that it, Stuart? That's it, Bob. Go for it. Excellent. All right. Um, I never know exactly what the topic's going to be until literally right before the presentation. And I understand my topic is why water. Um, but looking at all your faces, I can see we've got undergraduate students and graduate students. We've got people in the health sciences. We've got people in environmental sustainability, um, engineering students, people looking at, at ways to change the world. Um, the easiest way to describe um, why water and, and where you're going would be to kind of share a little bit of my background that got me all the way up to, to having the opportunity to meet with Stuart and kind of see what the, the whole idea behind this water emissary program um, is and where it's going and, and, and why you can play a really important role in um, the evolution of where we're going with water, um, climate change, disadvantaged communities, and, and kind of putting things you know, on, on, a, on a straight and narrow path to real success. Um, you know, I'd like to tell you that everybody has a great career design plan in mind and, and, and you know exactly where you're going. You know, you, you're a senior in high school and you apply for the right college and you pick the right program and you know where you're going to grad school and everything's just going to work out great for you. Never does. Um, you know, I actually got into the water industry um, completely by accident. I totaled the city manager's wife's car on my way home from lunch as a junior high, junior in high school and had to uh, pay for the deductible um, uh, reading water meters on roller skates in 1979. Um, it was not a pretty sight back then, I'll tell you. Um, but uh, in, in getting involved in that, if you understand federal legislation, what happens is um, President Nixon, for those of you that you know, did a little bit of history work, um, actually signed the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And any federal legislation takes five years to promulgate meaning it takes five years to actually implement. And it was 1979, and I was a junior in high school, hanging out with a bunch of water guys, and they said, hey, guy, um, we got to go get all these licenses and certification. We have to pass all these health exams in order to run a community drinking water system, something we've been doing for 30 years. This is nonsense. I said, it can't be that hard. Um, and while I was still in high school, I had the opportunity to go to community college, get water certification certificates, um, while I was still in high school. That gave me the opportunity to, to find my way working for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which is the largest water treatment organization in the United States. It's massive. It treats all the water from Ventura, California, i.e. Santa Barbara, all the way down to San Diego, the, the, the Mexican border. Um, and so I worked for that organization for five years, was a utility director in one city, a public works director in another city. Um, I was nominated among my peers to basically have the opportunity to represent Los Angeles County as the water master, which is appointed by the Superior Court of Los Angeles. Sitting in the Superior Court one day, 
in walks the lawyer that represented Aaron Brockovich in the Aaron Brockovich case. All accidents. You know, I'd love to tell you it was this grand plan. I had this perfect idea. I knew what I was going to be. I knew where I was going. I knew what was going to happen. One accident led to another accident, led to another accident, led to another accident. Sitting in a courtroom with, with uh, Tom Girardi, the lawyer from the Aaron Brockovich case, and the rest is history. Um, I represent a number of, of uh, uh, communities, states. Uh, I represent the attorney general in North Carolina, New Mexico. I was the expert witness in the Flint, Michigan case, if you understand water. So it opened the opportunity up to, to engage in all those activities. I work with all 50 state Safe Drinking Water Act administrators, Clean Water Act administrators. I also work with um, uh, non-government organizations, uh, Waterkeeper Environmental Working Group. And believe it or not, I actually work with corporate America, but I will only represent corporate America that wants to do things right. If you don't wanna do things right, I will fire you, you will not fire me. And so I have the opportunity to physically go in and work with these people, which leads me to all 50 states. And so we have the opportunity to go in and do the right thing. One of the things I want to impart to you before you start firing off the questions is it's not that complicated. Whether you're on the path to be an environmental engineer and you wanna go in and do natural resources work and, and understand and, and catalog all of the, the water resources, water quality, how they can be used, measure um, climate change and things like that from an environmental perspective, you can do that. Likewise, you have the opportunity if you're in the public health field to work in public health when it comes to drinking water. We were joking uh, just before you came on, the, the United States is carved into 10 regions with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Region one, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Three are medical doctors, Three are environmental engineers of those six states. I will tell you, environmental engineers and doctors, left brain, right brain, don't even like each other. But that's what's running the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act in this country. Unfortunately, and I, I kind of kibitz there a little bit with, with Stuart about the, you know, there's all these Biden bucks in infrastructure coming our way. What are we going to do with them? We're going to solve the, the lead in drinking water program or lead and drinking water problems around the country. Um, this week's headline, Philadelphia, 65% of the schools in Philadelphia still have lead in the drinking water in 2022. I'm not shaking my head, I'm pissed off. Okay, because they could have fixed that problem 35 years ago. What happens is, is anytime there's all this federal money seeded into these programs, all the people get their little pots out and they go around and they get their contributions from all those those programs, and they go right back to our politicians. And this is why the, the uh, small and disadvantaged communities around the country um, are still suffering. And I don't mean the aggregate, the, 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 the farm workers in the Central California um, situation. We have over 800 community drinking water systems in the Central Valley of California where migrant farm workers are drinking water. I wouldn't feed my dog. Okay. It happens in the Appalachia, it happens in the Ozarks. It happens in Alabama. It happens everywhere across this country. It actually happens in the suburbs of Manhattan. So it can occur virtually everywhere. And it's because of this consulting engineering industrial complex where they just, they, they, they pass the plate and they take 50% of every dollar that should be going to solving the lead in community drinking water systems problem years ago. Unfortunately, when we look at the regulatory process of establishing maximum contaminant levels for drinking water contaminants in our drinking water systems around the country, we spend about 10 years talking about it, and then we spend 10 years looking at it, and then we spend 10 years studying it, and then when you kind of step back and look at the situation, you kind of say, okay, we're going to take this approach or that approach, then we go into the regulatory negotiation process. And everybody gets to negotiate the numbers back to something that's completely unrealistic or, or, or not even achievable. It's 2022. And I literally got off the phone right before this conference call today uh, and had a conversation with the North Texas Municipal Water Utility District, which serves over two and a half million people in the North Texas suburbs of Dallas, Fort Worth, Tyler. All these systems 
receive their water from a, a wholesale water agency, much like the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And it's the concept is really, really, really simple for you to understand. When water gets contaminants in them, there's really only three categories of contaminants in drinking water. There's microbiological, which is coliform, E. coli, things that animals basically digest and poop into our drinking water. You know, they're microbial, they can cause disease. Those are the things that, that are most concerned. They can cause immediate illness. And then it's really as simple as organics and inorganics. And if you remember your sophomore chemistry class, inorganics are all your salts and your metals and your organics are anything with a carbon molecule attached to them. Okay, so if you've got carbon in there, it's inorganic. Those are the only three contaminants in drinking water. And you either have to take out the ions that are inorganic or you have to absorb out all the carbon molecules. If we just look at it that way, it's really that simple. It took me 35 years to convince Aaron Brockovich, all we have to do is take the dirt out of our drinking water and things will be so much better. You know, if you remove the dirt from drinking water, the organics, decaying leaves and grasses, my colleagues get really angry with me because I, I take, they get up there and they go, tetramethyl ethyl death. And I go, you mean dirt? And they're like, well, you're oversimplifying it. No, organics is decaying matter. Decaying matter by Webster's definition in the dictionary is dirt. And so whether it's algae, dead animals, dead grasses, dead leaves, all those organics find their way into our drinking water supplies. Those organics, when they hit our drinking water systems, if the dirt isn't removed from our drinking water supply, we overchlorinate. When you overchlorinate, you decrease the pH, which causes lead leaching. Oh my, isn't that what happened in Flint, Michigan? So if you'd have taken out the dirt, you wouldn't have had to put in so much chlorine. If you didn't have to put in so much chlorine, you wouldn't have caused the lead leaching. Gosh, problem solved, take the dirt out of the drinking water, okay? You can Google this tonight. I challenge all of you to Google North Texas Municipal Water Utility District tonight. They are doing what they call a free chlorine burn. And what they do is rather than take the dirt out of the drinking water, which it costs less than 29 cents per person in the, in the number that was shown to you earlier, they'll spend that money on an advertising campaign to tell you, we're about to engage in a free chlorine burn and the water will be perfectly safe to bathe in and drink. And we're gonna do it for the next month. And what they've done and what they found out in science is rather than take the dirt out of the drinking water, if you add ammonia or nitrogen to drinking water, it forms chloramine. So chlorine will attach to ammonia and it will not oxidize dirt. If it doesn't oxidize dirt, it doesn't form trihalomethanes, chloroform. Chloroform causes, remember that's what they used to use in the Civil War, they put chloroform in the cloth, put it over somebody, knock them out, saw off their leg, that's chloroform. Chloroform is what's formed when you put chlorine and water with dirt in it. You know that, that chlorine in drinking water has no smell, but every one of us have been to a, a swimming pool in a public place and you can smell chlorine. That's the chlorine attacking the organics or the dirt in the drinking water. Most of, of the chlorine smell in a gymnasium or a, in a spa is actually chloroform, okay? Chlorine and water do not have an odor. And so what happens is, is all these organics get oxidized. So they add ammonia and it sequesters those chemical reactions. The ammonia becomes food for bacteria. Do you know Legionella, which is a deadly pneumonia that has killed people around this country, is up 6,000% in the last 15 years. CDC will report it's up 6,000%. So what they do in North Texas today and they advertise this in the newspaper today, they turn the ammonia off and they turn the chlorine up. And so if you're pregnant and you're taking a hot shower in a Dallas suburb tonight, the likelihood that you're gonna have a first trimester um, spontaneous abortion has increased 5,000%. If you're in your third trimester, the likelihood that you go into premature labor is increased 5,000%. And so, these are the kinds of things where science, from an environmental perspective, crosses over into um, the health. 
Now, how, what does this have to do with climate change? As climate change occurs, what's happening is you're getting these massive uh, environmental uh, storm events in various areas around the country. You get hot water, it causes algae blooms. Algae blooms die. When they die, they create more organics that causes more chlorine, that causes more disinfection byproduct. And so it has a tremendous impact on the chemistry based on global warming activities. Um, have anybody you know, heard of the Lake Okeechobee um, algae bloom? I mean, literally Google two years ago, you couldn't go into South Florida because of the hazardous algae blooms. They believe that those algae blooms, when those little algaes pop, they're actually causing neurological diseases like Lou Gehrig's. So if you're walking along a stream, there's an algae bloom caused by global warming, caused by higher nutrients or dirt in the drinking water, and those algae bloom pustules pop, you'll see signs along the sides of a river, or the sides of a lake or a canal in Florida. Don't let your dogs go in them. It will kill a dog in 15 minutes. It could potentially cause Lou Gehrig's disease in five. So these are the kinds of things where environmental science, engineering, crossover, and why water. I don't want to take all your time, and I don't see where Stuart's at on here, um, but I want, to, I want to open this up for a lot of opportunity to ask questions. I guess the message that I would like to introduce to this class on this day is why water has a lot of, of, of different aspects to different graduate programs that you may or may not be working on that will cross over. And we need to get your generation to start basically calling bullshit on what's going on and start making sure that all the money gets where it belongs and that these community drinking water systems have the opportunity. The money to solve these problems is less than the numbers that were put up here. But these numbers that are put up here are put up here um, you know, to give politicians warm and fuzzy feelings. But at the end of the day, the, the number is much less and the impact is far greater, but it's going to take your generation to cut through the, you know, the, the fancy uh, wine and steak dinners that, that uh, occur on both sides. I mean, I don't want to be partisan at all. Um, both sides hate me for saying it this way, but uh, you know, whether you're in the very liberal state of California where our governor went to the French laundry with Poseidon, a, a drinking water engineering firm, or you want to go to, you know, uh, DeSantis down in Florida and, and, and what he does down there. They all do it. And you guys need to get to the bottom line. And it's as simple as get the dirt out. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> I, I love how you're able to express things that often people get very, very complicated and um, lose, particularly laymen, like we all are in water, and uh, just make it so understandable and also realize that we all, we can have a solution. And a, go ahead. No, I was just saying it's, it's much easier than everybody wants to make it. Yeah. Well, and as we know, um, you know, the politicians are, are in office today, really serving their own self interest and not representing the public's interest. They're just wanting to make sure they get reelected. So, yeah. And, and we need to have young people enter the political world. So that's gonna be really important to have that, those voices. And as I've said to many of the, the emissaries, we need to have more women in these leadership positions. Absolutely. So, you yeah. know, it's, it's very, very interesting. It's like for the grad students out there, you know, you've all heard the, the, the phrase that was probably ginned up in the twenties, which was publish or perish. And uh, I had a grad student come through here um, that wrote a, wrote a book on the California water situation in Western United States. And he, he listened to me and he accidentally titled his, his, his thesis in his book ultimately um, based on what I told him. And, and it was titled, Why They Prefer Chaos. Um, the, it's now called Dividing the Waters, but the original title was Why They Prefer Chaos and his advisor would not let him call it that. But it's why they prefer chaos. As long as we keep you baffled and bullshit, you'll allow this to continue. Don't let it continue. <laughs> or somebody raise a hand or turn your mic off. Mr. Yeah, so Wilcock, I had a quick question. Um, you said that the you know, number one way we can clean water is by removing the dirt, but what is the best method for doing that, especially in a municipality? 
Um, it depends on the source and the type of carbon that's in the water, um, but there are very natural processes um, that, that it, it's funny. Um, uh, I, the, the answer, the short answer is granular activated carbon, GAC. It's the black stuff that if any of you had fish tanks as kids, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's carbon and carbon can come from wood, lignite, peat moss, um, bituminous coal from West Virginia, you know, the coal that they burn in power plants, you can use that. Coconut. Rice husks. Rice husks. Coconut. Coconut husks is the number one source. Right. Well, we have a technology that we've invested in, Bob, that has rice husks. That oh, are rice husks. Form of Perfect carbon yeah. source. Perfect yeah. carbon source. A, a, a little history lesson. I love to, I love to always take you all the way back to where stuff happened because when you believe, when you hear how it happened, you just scratch your head. It's kind of like how I ended up in water. Um, and, and, and so what happened was World War I. What happened? Where they were all getting gassed by mustard gas in the trenches. And so believe it or not, they invented activated carbon to take the chlorine out of the, 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 the air to save the soldiers that were getting gassed by the chlorine. And they, the, the primary source was coconut husks, unlike rice husks in World War I. And so they had the gas masks that they developed. And uh, what happened at the beginning of World War II? Oh, MacArthur lost the Philippines. He lost our coconut shell source. So the guys from the Department of Defense got on a train in Washington, D.C. in a panic. And they went up to Pittsburgh. And they went up to, a, to Pittsburgh Coken Tower where they were making steel and they went to Carnegie's guys and they said, hey, can we convert one of your steel mills at the beginning of World War II? Because we lost the Philippine carbon that was coming out with the coconut shells. And so what are we gonna do? Can you guys, can you take West Virginia coal and make carbon for gas masks for World War II? And they said, we can try. And so Pittsburgh Coken Tower did that. It's currently now called Calgon, which is Calgon Carbon Corporation. Calgon Carbon Corporation was a boiler water treatment company, and the name stands for Calcium Gone. And so they actually treated boilers to prevent calcium from precipitating out in boilers. They bought the Department of Defense's carbon business, and that's what we call Calgon Carbon today. So it, it, it's literally all tied to the Department of Defense and the fact that MacArthur lost the Philippines. It's that simple and that stupid, but that easy. And so the rice husks are a wonderful, wonderful alternative. Bob, I love how I learn every time from you something new, a new fun fact that I never thought was possible. It's awesome. Yeah. Who else, who else has a question for Bob or comment? Hi, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so my question was regarding the infrastructure. So the water distribution infrastructure has a really bad grade according to the ASCE. So would you say that the deterioration will negatively impact the quality leading to waterborne diseases? Yes, absolutely. Two reasons. Um, most of our infrastructure should have lasted twice as long as it did. And what happens is because we've been taught as a society that more is better. You know, it's like, you need more of this and you need more of that. And you know, it's, it's, it, it cracks me up because there's a, there's a corporation out there that, that sells chemicals and they, they all sell the same stuff. It comes, you know, you buy it by the rail car, you, you convert it to totes, you dilute it down to 55 gallon drums, you put it in, in one gallon containers. And it's, it's 10 guys have made money off the same batch of chemical by the time it gets to the, the, the individual. And, and what's happened is, is we've actually destroyed our infrastructure from the inside out, um, Flint, Michigan. And it was because what happened was they were constantly chasing the dragon. They were constantly trying to fix the problem. If they had taken the dirt out, do you know if you take the dirt out of drinking water, you can feed a milligram per liter of chlorine. If you don't take the dirt out, you have to feed four milligrams per liter in order to end up with a residual of one milligram per liter. Take the dirt out. If you take the dirt out, you just save three milligrams per liter of chlorine. You don't have to waste and you don't eat holes in your pipes. Clean the dirt out. It's really that simple. And, and, and when you do it, you accidentally have all these other impacts. Okay. So it, when it comes to carbon, you adsorb it. When it comes to um, uh, inorganics, you know, nitrates, 
um, chromium, uh, arsenic. You have to exchange those ions. And so that's ion exchange processes. Um, and, and so you basically, they're both capturing the contaminant, concentrating it, collecting it and destroying it and removing it from the environment forever. If it has a carbon molecule, you absorb it on carbon. If it has a inorganic chemistry, you, you, you exchange it and you exchange it with either sodium or, or phosphate or um, uh, calcium, you know, and, and those, and, you know, a thousand parts of calcium in order to get 50 parts of a contaminant off, it's a pretty good exchange. And then you basically destroy it. Um, so that's back to your infrastructure. Um, I think the, the, the Society of Civil Engineers basically give it like a D. I give it like a, a three F minus. Um, we ate holes in it, you know? It, our infrastructure is like the American diet. We've got a lot of cancer to deal with. Thank you. Um, so I had a question about like the removing the dirt. Um, so something that I've been learning about in one of my classes is how sediment and water is a really big part of like long-term carbon cycles yes. with like um, burial of carbon and that kind of thing. So when you're removing the dirt out of like drinking water, that'd be like coming out of rivers. Um, so what are you, what would you do with the sediment if that's going to like kind of disrupt the like carbon burial process? Is there like a way to leave enough in to where you're still like burying carbon or are you going to move the sediment somewhere else out of a, like I, what's the idea with yeah, that? Yeah. Um, you're talking about in the environment, the carbon in the environment. And, and there's a certain balance that does need to be there and it should be good carbon. And there, and there are ways to do that. I'm talking about in the drinking water systems, there should, the carbon should be all gone by the time it gets to the drinking water supply. That's take the dirt out. To answer your question on the Clean Water Act side, um, you want good carbon in the environment, okay? You want natural processes. Um, what happens is all the farms in Wisconsin, okay, they, they fertilize with nitrates and, and phosphates and all those types of fertilizers. They all end up in the river system and they come down. They're what cause the, the nasty algae blooms, you know, the, the unwelcome carbon, the unbalanced carbon, the good carbon, you know, the natural peat moss processes, the, those kinds of things that don't cause the, the detrimental flips in the, in the uh, systems and things like that. It's, you know, it's, it's 2022 and, and when Omaha, Nebraska gets a rainstorm and they have a combined sewer outfall, Literally raw sewage from Omaha ends up in Kansas City's drinking water 72 hours later. It's 2022, we gotta knock that. It's, I, I'm ashamed to admit my generation let it happen. There's no excuse for it. And it wouldn't, you know, they'll, they'll wrap themselves in the flag and say it's all money, 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 money. And it's all, no, you've had 10 engineering firms study it every year for the last 10 years. It, the money you could have spent on all those damn studies would have fixed the problem. That's why I'm saying it's like we don't in when it comes to why water. We need studies. We need innovation. We need new technologies. We need to develop rice husk carbon sources. We need to develop natural ways of doing things. But we don't need to study the study of the study of the study study so that somebody else can publish a paper that might have some implication that was valid in 1945 in 2025. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Let's, let's get on to business. Um, and that's why I, I implore you as students and as people learning that the, that the engineers talk to the medical professionals, that, that, that talk to the structural people, that you, know, you come to this symbiotic relationship that all this money being wasted on getting the dirt out of drinking water that should have been done 35 years ago, I would rather be spending on global warming activities, things that really are gonna make a difference as we go forward. You know, why are we wasting money still talking about getting dirt out of drinking water? Flint, Michigan, do you know how many, Flint, Michigan was, is, is seven years old about six weeks ago, okay? I was there, it was, I, I'll tell you what it was because my wife's still pissed off about it. Um, it was Valentine's Day seven years ago, and I was in Michigan and not with my wife, <laughs> so I know when it was. 
And so what happened was um, the, all the politicians have, they still haven't changed the damn pipe. Yeah, there's, something, there's something like 20% of the population of Flint, Michigan still does not have water in their homes and they're having to buy bottled water for all of their uses of water. Yeah. And, and they could have fixed it in about 15 minutes if they'd have just done what they should have done. And it wouldn't have cost them half as much. And I don't even know if anyone has still been held accountable for this in a, uh, a, a court case. Has it, Bob? Yes and no. The people paid off the people, but the people that did it walked. It's kind of... Uh, the taxpayers paid for a problem that the politicians caused. Um, there was, um, I was the attorney general's witness in that particular case. Um, believe it or not, the, the Flint, Michigan trials had nothing to do with lead contamination. They were all for 14 Legionella deaths at the hospital. Hmm. People don't know that. It's funny. I, I always tell water professionals, uh, you know, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, uh, something interesting for you guys. Everybody knows about Flint, Michigan and everybody thinks it's about lead contamination, right? Okay, we have maximum contaminant levels at the US EPA for arsenic. There's a maximum contaminant level. There's a maximum contaminant level for, for uranium in drinking water. I mean, we have a maximum contaminant level for uranium. Um, do you know, we, Aaron Brockovich, um, that story is 26 years old. We still do not have a maximum contaminant level for chromium. So I speak to water treatment professionals that are actually, you know, I'll speak to 500 at a time and um, they're all going for licensing and certification and they're all excited. And I'll walk out and I'll say, what's the maximum contaminant level for lead in drinking water? And they'll all go 15. What's the, for the engineers out there, what's the maximum contaminant level for lead in drinking water in the United States of America? I'll give you the answer. It's a trick question. There isn't one. one. <laughs> there, isn't one. there isn't one. For lead in drinking water in the United States of America in 2022, it's called an action level. And an action level says if more than a certain percentage of your customers are drinking water over a certain threshold that's acceptable for your community standards, we ask that you pinky swear that you promise you'll do something. That's the requirement for lead in 2022 in the United States of America, right now, okay? Yes. What's, and, and, and do you know how many lead tests were done today? Probably 500,000 lead tests. And you can Google Philadelphia, 60% of the schools, Monday, that was the headline, okay? Exceed the action level. So all this information's out there, 500,000 tests were done. How many politicians ra raised, you know, shook their sabers and screamed about lead and drinking water and promised to do something? You know, President Biden gets up there and says, half my money's going to disadvantaged communities for lead service lines. Hey, no, it won't. It won't happen, guys. It's not going to happen unless you guys make it happen. You know, all this stuff will happen. But at the end of the day, there's still not a maximum camera level for lead and drinking water in North America. Okay. And there were 500,000 tests done on it because the politicians are demanding more testing. What's the maximum contaminant level for Legionella in the United States of America today in 2023? Legionella is a bacteria that if you're, if, if anybody over about 40 inhales it in the shower, which believe it or not, there's all kinds of nasty stuff you inhale in your drinking water when you take a shower. Uh, I don't wanna scare you, but if you've heard of the brain eating amoeba, we kill a half a dozen kids in this country every year with that little guy in our drinking water supplies. But we kill several thousand with Legionella. What's the maximum contaminant level for Legionella in drinking water in the United States of America today? Not a trick question. There is one. <laughs> Not a trick question. There is one. It's zero. Now, here's the part that'll piss you off. How many tests were done for Legionella in the United States of America this month? Maximum contaminant level zero, but you don't have to test. There's no maximum contaminant level for lead, but because <laughs> it's sexy, there were 500,000 tests today. 
Amazing. Uh, Mr. Bocock, who does it benefit to not have a maximum level for lead? Like why have why hasn't it been established? It, if it helps somebody keep that, you know, keep a lack of maximum level. Um, subject to debate, but I have an opinion. Uh, <laughs> but it's my own. <laughs> um, uh, so lead service lines were, um, you know, kind of nineteen twenty to 1970, really popular, sexy, and cheap. So we put in hundreds of thousands and all over the country. You know, everybody thinks, oh, lead service lines are a, uh, you know, an East Coast problem or a Midwest problem. We got them in San Diego. We got them in LA. It was cheap. Um, and I don't know whether you know this or not, but you know, the rule is called the lead and copper rule for the engineers. So if you look under the EPA standard, it's called the lead and copper rule. Do you know what replaced lead? Copper. So uh, soft metal, they can squeeze it out in a tube. So most, if you're not on a lead service line, you're or a plat, and, and and the new people are on plastic. You know, it's PVC. Um, and then and then lead kind of replaced was replaced by copper. Um, it doesn't serve anyone's interest other than the fact that. Water people, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a social issue. It's a cultural issue. They absolutely are, are. We've been doing it this way for fifty years. Damn it, Peter! How dare you question what we've been doing? <laughs> As you get older, you'll understand what I just said. But it's becoming a, it's becoming a great frustration. It's like, why don't they clean the dirt out of the North Texas water as opposed to go to a chlorine burn today? Because they, yeah, they literally spent more. I've looked at their budget. They spent more on public relations to do a chlorine burn in North Texas than it would have cost them to not. So, Bob, um, I'm going to just jump in to say, and and I, please, uh, I hope there's more questions from from uh, our emissaries. A lot of what you've shared is is pretty. Uh, disparaging and disappointing. How about sharing with us some optimism and solutions and reason for hope? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm looking at you. Um, it's you. I mean, it's your generation. It's your generation that's going to have to bridge those gaps. That's going to have to not be afraid of the truth, be able to share information across science lines. Um, you know, I, I was not joking. I, I literally uh, I, I go to all 50 State Safe Drinking Water Act administrators and half are medical professionals and half are um, uh, environmental engineers. And, and you know, I go into those states and the environmental engineers think that doctors are high and mighty and don't want to have conversations with them. And the doctors think that the engineers are, you know, boot dredging slugs um, and they, they, they don't communicate. Stop. Share information. Don't be afraid to communicate. Don't be afraid to look for the simple answer as opposed to the complex answer. Show some guts, actually execute. Don't chicken out and say, oh, I need to go and have uh, you know, this consulting engineer validate what that consulting engineer said before I take a decision. And if I'm lucky enough, I get three consulting engineers to study this problem for the next five years, and then I get my pension. Don't do that. There's a positive way. I mean, it's not disparaging. I have a lot of hope in your generation that you'll do the right things. And it's because you're learning. You're calling BS on this stuff. You're looking at, you know, people, there's still an argument about global warming and climate change. I don't care what you call it. It's something that's, it's a phenomenon we're all dealing with. It does impact water. It impacts water, both quantity and quality on the surface water bodies, in our, our rivers, lakes, streams, drinking water supplies our oceans, you know, it's a hydrologic cycle. Everything, you know, people joke, you know, it's, it's some generations say, you know, you're drinking Napoleon's pee and other people say you're drinking the dinosaur's pee. Bottom line, it's every, every drop of water that's on the earth today was here 10,000 years ago and it's just all been recycled. And it's up to you guys to 
leave the right amount of organics in our, our natural settings that help prevent flooding, that help mitigate climate change, that help, you know, mitigating climate change that stops flooding impacts how much dirt's in the drinking water, impacts how much water ultimately gets impacted by um, uh, nutrients that cause algae blooms. You solve one little problem at the top of the watershed, it will trickle down to so many other aspects. If you make, if you make one small, you drop one stone in a dam at the top of an aquifer, you will impact what happens in Louisiana. I mean, think about it that way. Think about everything you do, everything you touch, everything you feel, everything you experience with water goes through everything. I mean, what do they say uh, that the percentage of the human body is water? You know, how much water goes into a, a glass of water and how much water goes into a pair of jeans? Um, you know, understand and, and have a respect for all aspects of that and it will change your life and it'll change the way you look at things and you will not allow yourself to be BS into government or, or industrial science nonsense. So I, it, I guess, Stuart, the, the positive thing is, is looking at these faces, I'm seeing a, a, the opportunity for change. Beautiful. Uh, it looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat. I'm not sure if we have time for them, but. Sure. I have time, I just, I don't see the chat. <laughs> you read them and I'll answer them. All right, the, fir the first question says, you talked about how to remove salts and biological molecules, but how do you remove heavy metals from water? <clears throat> There's a number of ways to, re uh, if we're talking specific, well, no, it actually works in all aspects. Um, you can remove water or, or heavy metals in natural water settings that don't become um, drinking water. So you want to remove heavy metals from a, uh, uh, the East River in Manhattan or in the Susquehanna River that goes to the, the oyster beds in the, in, uh, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, you can actually understand that the same thing that I said about water, all the water being on the earth is all the water that's on the earth, all the heavy metals on the earth are all the heavy metals that were here 10,000 years ago. They've just been redistributed and they've accumulated. So what you have to do is you have to identify like let's say you wanna pull mercury and lead and some of those really heavy metals out of a, a surface water body in order to prevent uh, destruction of an ecosystem. You have to be able to go in, and this is less medical, but more engineering, and actually cause those metals to settle out into an area where you will understand that they will accumulate, but then there has to be an extraction from that accumulation. And so sometimes we're allowed to do uh, wetlands and what's cool about wetlands is, is you can actually cause um, plants to adsorb or, or uptake those heavy metals and then harvest them and destroy them and accumulate them in, in uh, managed areas. Or you can take the sediment, you know, you, you, you put a wetland in and all the sediment will back up to there and you're gonna have to go in with mechanical means and excavate it. But when you do, you now have all that heavy metal you know, accumulated in a particular area. And it's about management and it's about science, but you have to use, you know, everybody thinks that, that you know, all this great mechanical and, and chemical uh, engineering can work. Actually, it's the simpler processes. If we step back and just look at things from a simple perspective, we can address 99% of the problems out there. Bravo. Madeline, next question. Uh, the other question was, why is there no incentive to push towards the real issues of dirt in the water if people, uh, I thought that people wanted to be cost efficient and gain money? It's funny. Um, they're finally figuring it out. Um, what happened was, so the issue of dirt and drinking water and why the infrastructure was destroyed and why everybody went to chloramination as opposed to free chlorine and, and all the, the economics of that. Um, I wanna give a short answer, but it could be really long, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to consolidate my answer. But what happened was <clears throat> World War II ends, Vietnam was kind of a, a mixed bag of tricks. The, the government didn't know what to do with it. That's when they sold 
like the carbon chemistry to um, uh, Calgon, who was just a, a boiler chemical company. Um, at the time, they said, what are we going to do with this? You guys are all too young, but, but, but Stuart and West will probably remember this because our grandmothers used to do it. But they actually took carbon during like the 70s and they put it in cigarette filters. Uh -huh. You remember those? I Stuart, do. So yeah, our yeah, grandmothers yeah. all smoked cigarettes with these little charcoal carbon filters in them. Char Charlton or something was one of them. Who was? Charlton might have been yeah. a brand or something. I, 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 and so, so that was the whole market. And then when the Superfund program hit and we discovered that there was TCE, PCE, benzene, rocket fuels, all these contaminants in our landfills, in our drinking water supplies, in our estuaries. And then all of a sudden what happened was this company that had basically made all the gas masks during World War II that was relegated to making cigarette filters they didn't have the supply chain to actually make money at it. And so they said, ooh, what are we gonna do? So in 1980, a pound of carbon cost $4. So granular activated carbon cost $4. And so what happened was everybody was like, wow, if we have to take the dirt out using carbon, it's gonna cost the average family of four, $20. And in 1980, that was a lot of money. And so they were like, oh no, we can't do that. What can we do to sequester this problem cheaply? And they figured it out. They said, oh, we'll add ammonia. It'll sequester the chemical reactions with the chlorine. We'll have to add more because the dirt will still be there. And then the systems all started nitrifying. Nitrification started eating the holes in them. Back to your other thing. But what they found out was for those people, the city of Cincinnati, do you know they buy their coal on a rail car from West Virginia and the city of Cincinnati owns its own kiln. They make their own granular activated carbon in the city of Cincinnati. So they figured it out. All the other manufacturers, now there's like 50 manufacturers out there. I saw Evoqua on something. Evoqua was doing something with somebody. I saw their, their name on something when I was looking here earlier. So Evoqua, <laughs> um, US Filter, um, Danaher, all these, you guys doing your rice husk stuff. Um, all these people started making coconut, uh, coconut carbon, all these other, there's 50 different kinds of carbon. There's 600 different types, 50 different manufacturers. So you can get carbon now. Something that costs $4 in 1980, a pound in, in 2022 is about 80 cents a pound. So if you guys just take inflation and economics, you know that, that the cost of carbon at 80 cents a pound in 2022, that was $4 a pound in 1980, now it's like time to take the dirt out. That's the easiest way to explain the economics. But what happened was all the 10 major engineering firms in the country went to all the water utilities and said, you can't afford that. Do this until things get better. Well, things are better. And they're still, they're, you know, they're hooked on the crack. I mean, they, they won't change. And so it's up to your generation to make them start changing. Some cities are changing. We're going around the country one city at a time. Um, you can Google this, Hannibal, Missouri. Hannibal, Missouri, Aaron and I put the stake in the ground and said, we are not leaving this town until they switch to GAC. Do you know why we picked Hannibal, Missouri? Any literature students in this group here? Riley got it? No, but I know that that's where Mark Twain is from, right? What was Mark Twain's famous saying? I don't know that much. <laughs> the coldest summer he ever spent was in San Francisco. Yeah, that's true too. But his most famous <laughs> saying when it comes to water is whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting for. And so we picked Hannibal, Missouri. We, they are on GAC now. The head of the environmental department in the state of Missouri said, we can't use GAC in Missouri because it's too cold. And I said, would you mind telling that to the people in Quebec? <laughs> so i mean it's we've made a lot of changes in this world and 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 i'll be honest with you guys and if aaron were sitting here and Stuart seen aaron and i go round and round um uh aaron wants to do she wants to solve every problem all the time life lesson you can't don't do it so about 10 years ago i told aaron i said aaron i can't 
we, you know, the flavor of the month, the contaminant of the day, we can be everyone's, we can be everyone's hero, but nobody's problem solver. And so I got her 10 years ago to focus on this issue of what the, and I don't, you know, when I get out there, it's total organic carbon reduction, TOC reduction, it's dirt. So I, I engage in the activity, I say, let's focus. If we get the dirt out of drinking water, we will save 80% of the communities. The other 20% are gonna have tetramethyl ethyl death and there's nothing we can do for them. At the end of the day, that's, um, Stuart and I are working on, um, have you heard of the perfluorinated carbons? PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, firefighting foam, of the emerging contaminants of the day, okay? Forever chemicals. Forever chemicals. Well, you know what's cool about them? They are, they are little, little bastards. They're, we, we don't, you know, they're, they're, there are 5,000 of those little creeps and they're really hard to destroy. But what makes them unique is you'll hear C8, C6, C4, C2. You know what C is? Carbon. They all absorb. So if you take the dirt out, you're going to accidentally take out the PFAS. Accidentally. It's like, mm -hmm. it just happens. And you can do it with rice husks. So take out the dirt, you're going to accidentally do a whole lot of other stuff too. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Madeline, any other questions there? No, not. There aren't any more in the chat. I don't know if any other of the emissaries have any more questions. If not, I've got a question for you, Bob. Just to, <clears throat> just to sort of complete the cycle, um, what then happens with the carbon once it contains some of these, these uh, contaminants? Good question. Um, it's, a, it's an engineering process for the engineering scientists out there. Um, it actually goes to an incinerator, okay, that goes to 4,000 degrees. And the cool part about it is the incineration process reactivates the carbon. So the carbon then actually is sustainable because it's reused, okay? So the carbon gets reused, you don't lose it. And all the, all the carbon that was adsorbed onto it so if you look, if you take a, a carbon ball, you just take a little grain of carbon, and if you were able to unfold it and lay it out flat, the amount of carbon that would fit in my hand is the size of a football field. Okay, it has all those magnetic, and it's it's magnetic. It just adsorbs. So the the, the carbon molecule goes across it, and it gets stuck in the spaces on the carbon ball and it gets absorbed. And then when you put it back into a kiln, what it does is it burns holes back in those carbon chunks, okay? And you can use coconut wood, lignite, bituminous from West Virginia. And so that it, all those get burned out. They go through a caustic soda scrubber and they get broken down into elements. So like the, the PFAS, you end up with fluorine in a caustic soda bath. And then you can take the caustic soda bath extract all the water out of it and the amount of contaminant that the city of Los Angeles would be able to extract in six months would fit in 255 gallon drums. I don't mean to tell you that, you know, we solve all the problems in the world. Those 55 gallon drums then, you know, get concentrated and get taken to a proper landfill where they're gone forever. Um, but it's not PFAS anymore. It's fluorine. I will tell you that 55 gallon drum of fluorine has less fluoride in it than what's in your drinking water that people actually add. So I'm not big on adding fluorine to drinking water, but they add it. So it's the way for uh, Simplot to get rid of all their, their mining waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, um, and same thing, what happens is it, bakes, it breaks it down to its elements and then those elements are properly disposed of. It all can be accomplished. It just needs to be one understood. And it needs to take people like you, Bob, that will stand up to the industry and to established powers that are financially driven by all the decisions instead of being driven by what's the right thing to do for our health and our right. well being, the right thing to do for the planet. Right. Uh, and if I could get a parting shot in here, Stuart, and it's something that's just happened within the last 10 days. 
Um, are, are you familiar with the, the term ESG that's starting to hit like all of our uh, people won't invest in certain stock unless the company has a certain ESG rating and it stands for environment, sustainability and governance. Okay, it's a big deal right now. Huge deal nationally and internationally. And what we're finding as an industry, and I'm starting to lose my mind over it, is the term greenwashing. And what greenwashing is, is these industries that are giving these numbers out that say, we are doing this for climate control, we're doing this for, for carbon sequestration, we're doing this for drinking water conservation, we're doing this for energy conservation. They're paying those same engineers that caused all these goddamn problems in the first place to lie for them. And the term is called greenwashing. I'm, count, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm counting on you guys to put an end to that. If you go to work for, for corporate America as an environmental engineer or a, 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 an environmental health officer, make them honest. It's not that hard. Um, you know, it's, it's really, and what's, what's frustrating, what will drive you nuts in your career if you go out there and you try to make a change in climate change, ESG, water conservation, health sciences, what will, what will drive you more crazy than anything is you will actually prove that if they do the right thing, not only will it cost them less, it will do more than, than taking a shortcut or, or bypassing the process and greenwashing a situation. Literally, um, greenwashing is, is, is something that it just drives me insane. I've actually convinced many, many corporations in this country that if they bought this $500,000 piece of equipment, I would save them a million dollars this year. You all know that $500,000 bought the equipment, the other $500,000 went to their bottom line. And they would still scratch their heads and, 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 and try to fight me on it. But it ha you will prove it. And it's up to you guys to demonstrate that more and more and more every day. That's a very important, powerful message. Anyone have just any parting comments you'd like to share with Bob from our emissaries? Who's ZU? I just saw that. ZU, ZU, ZU. Somebody just commented. ZU commented. I love it. I love the comment. That's why I wanted to call attention to it. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's me. I had to join on my phone because I was in another meeting for a conference. Oh, Zoom so user. Yeah. I'm Zoom you. user for today. So you, you know what I'm talking about when I said greenwashing, you heard about yes, it. Yes, yes. Yeah. He talked about it because it was making him really mad. Yeah, it, me too. Within the last 10 days, it wasn't even part of what I was going to talk about, but I couldn't help it. All right, okay. Stuart. Bob, you're awesome. Thank you so much for your knowledge, your information, your passion. And just so you know, Bob is one of our active advisors in the well community. And he, I'd say he's, he's one of the few that every time I reach out to Bob, he responds and he says, yes, anytime that he's possible to do so to support us. So I, I share that with you to let you know that he's here to support you and the community. And if you have you know, other questions for him or um, ways that you think that he could help you in your career or your studies, feel free to either let us know or we can get you in touch with Bob directly. Hope that's okay, Bob. Yep. Great. So Caroline, do we have um, anything further or are we ready, ready to end? Um, one announcement is if you go to the next slide, Madeline, um, I put a link in the chat for a water facts quiz or the next one after that. Yeah. Um, so if you guys wanna take that quiz, it's a really great opportunity to test your knowledge on water, maybe learn a little bit more about it. Um, just a take home activity for you guys to do that we thought would be fun. It is actually a really fun activity and surprisingly, as a matter of fact, Bob, we'll share it with you as well because I think you'd enjoy seeing it. And if everyone would just take the time, it'll take you, I don't know, five, seven minutes to do it. And uh, we may talk about that. We will talk about it um, in our next session just to see what you learned or what you were surprised by. And um, yeah, I think you'll find it valuable. So our next event is on Monday at 7.30 East time, correct? Yes, and we're going to be doing another community session where you guys will be able to 
kind of interact more and we'll do an activity and also discuss the spirituality of water. So that's our theme for our next session. Yeah, so part of that is about the messages of water, the ability for water to communicate, to receive your messages and to have a memory. So we uh, will have a speaker that will blow your mind with what you will learn about water and see the messages of water. Okay, well, if anyone has anything else, don't hesitate to reach out, let us know. Caroline, do we wanna also maybe set up either a, a WhatsApp or a Slack for the emissaries to be able to connect with each other and communicate? I think that would be nice. So let's think about that or get feedback from everybody, which uh, platform and channel they may prefer to use for us to communicate and connect with each other when we are offline. Yes, definitely. We'd like to set that up um, pretty soon, actually. So if you guys do have any preferences um, of how you'd like to communicate, feel free to type them in the chat or send them by email. Wonderful. Well, once again, thank you, Bob. Thank you. And we'll, we'll look forward to our next time together on Monday. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.